450 billion. The negotiation brought it down to 400 billion. And then you clearly talked about some um, some expenditures that are non-discretionary also at the counties. And I want to make it clear that I'm not saying that non-discretionary expenditures are only at the national government. Even at the counties, there are non-discretionary expenditures, and I agree with you. Payment of salaries are non-discretionary unless you retrench. Um, there are payments to doctors, there are CBS, which have been agreed on. But what I'm saying... Uh, uh, what I see is pull the mic closer to you, please. What, what I'm saying, the, the, the point I'm trying to bring out is that at both levels, we have non-discretionary expenditures, national and county. What we may need to do is both levels, again, should cut on discretionary expenditures. And so as national government, and that is why the national government is bearing the biggest share, actually 93%, uh, uh, 0.6, and the uh, counties is bearing 6.3%. Uh, we are alive to the fact that counties don't have the capacity or resilience that the national government would have uh, to absorb some of these cuts. And that is why you find that our proposal is to have a lesser cut at the counties and a higher cut at the national government. So just the same way we went for some of the expenditures at the national government to be cut at 50%, like hostility, like traveling, etc. You'll also agree with me, Madam Chair, that counties are also traveling, that there are also recurrent expenditures of hostility at the counties. How I wish that we agree that counties must also, as we cut these expenditures at the national government level, then we also maintain and retain, and the county assemblies should do that, that all the non-discretionary expenditures must still be maintained, because you can't change them, but go for the wastages also at the county in terms of uh, certain budget lines that can be cut. Because we, we, are, we live in this country, we see members of county assembly all over the place, also the same as members of national assembly and in the Senate. Uh, we also see county executives traveling across the globe the same way as executive. So as we rain on the executive of the national government to cut on these discretionary expenditures, I would do, our proposal as Treasury is that the counties must also be asked to cut on these expenditures. On the delay of disbursement of funds, again, I want to agree with you and say that this is causing a strain in the county governments. They go borrowing very expensive bank loans, and I am not supporting that uh, trajectory. The current predicament, or what we have found ourselves into, maybe it is not the subject of discussion today, but we are alive to it, is that we are not yet done with the legal framework the legal framework, to be able to transfer funds to the county. I will tell you, and I tell this committee, that I have already written, because I initially had a clear mind based on the uh, provisions of the PFM regulations that we could pay up to 50%. Uh, but then there are, is another school of thought that that cannot happen. And that I had to ask for Attorney General's opinion, which later went to the Attorney General on Wednesday last week. It doesn't help Treasury to accumulate and disburse funds to the counties. It puts unnecessary pressure and strain on us. So I want to just be very clear that it is not in the interest of the National Treasury not to disburse funds to the county, or as, at least as far as I'm concerned. Um, And, uh, now, the issues that um, Honorable uh, Senator Eddy raised. Yes, counties don't have as much flexibility as national government in terms of re raising revenue. And I think that is one of the reasons why we made provisions in law that money that has already been shared to the counties should not be reduced in terms of transfer in the event that there is a shortfall in revenue collection. 
But again, Article 219, my understanding of Article 219, it, dis it, 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 it deals with the transfer of funds. It doesn't deal with the legislation. It doesn't deal with the bills. What this article simply says is that once a budget is passed, once the Division of Revenue Act is passed, the national government must transfer all the rev shareable revenue to the counties. But it doesn't say that the same legislative organ cannot change the figures. That, to me, I have not seen in this constitution, and I have interacted with this constitution a lot. I do know that you cannot take away the legislative power of parliament. Parliament can decide to amend. And by the way, I want to be very clear here. The 400 billion was based on a projected revenue of 2.9 trillion. The projected revenue now is 2.6 trillion. So you cannot base the shareable revenue of the county to 2.9 trillion when you are dealing with 2.6 trillion. And therefore the House can decide on its wisdom, the both houses can decide either to agree to amend downwards the Division of Revenue Act or the House, the two houses can reject, in which case then 400 billion will be the amount. But the moment Senate and National Assembly amends the share of revenue, it becomes a law. So that Article 219 would not be violated. That article would only be violated if National Treasury fails to transfer the money that Parliament in its entirety, the two houses, have approves, approved. And I think uh, Honorable Ed also raised the same issue um, that of uh, the non-discretionary uh, lines in the county expenditures, and I think I addressed that. Honorable, the majority whip in the Senate, uh, my friend, Boni Alwale, you have um, you have talked about uh, the executive giving a, de a decision, or coming up with a decision, and uh, treating it as a legislative decision. And that we don't have power, which is true, to amend. And that the courts will declare whatever we come up with as illegal and maybe unconstitutional. Yes, it is true that when the president declined to assent to the finance bill of 2024, he indicated under bullet number five, uh, I don't think you have this, uh, this memorandum from the president, Although the president is also part of the legislative process, uh, we, in our own wisdom, we made the president part of our legislative process, including uh, on budget matters. But the president said, this is what he said, that, Father, I have directed the National Treasury, and I underline the word direct, and I'm asking, who is he directing? He is actually directing the National Treasury, because I would have had a problem if he directed the National Assembly of the Senate. Parliament. But directing National Treasury is perfectly within uh, his powers as the President to immediately submit to Parliament. And the direction or the directive was to submit to Parliament amendments to the Division of Revenue Act 2024. And that is exactly what we have done. We have not reduced any, ex any share of revenue to counties. What we have done is to submit a proposal to the organ that can that has the power to do so, and that organ is Parliament, to amend the Division of Revenue to reflect the reduced revenues occasioned by the rejected finance bill. So the President was actually directing my office and my ministry to submit to Parliament legislative proposal to amend the law. And that is what we have done. So I don't think we have done anything illegal and unconstitutional to that effect. Parliament has all the powers to deal with this matter. Um, and, and Honorable Boni, uh, Senator Boni, you have uh, talked about my pet topic, 
as your number two issue, and that is the revenue leakages. As a matter of fact, we would not be here today if we um, if we mainstreamed proper financial management prudency in our financial system. And I can't agree with you more. It is not just about the revenue collection, it's even the revenue use. And at both levels of government, national and county. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm addressing Senator Boni Adwale, whom I know very well, is passionate about, um, about proper use of public funds. Mtetezi, yeah, wanyongi. So I absolutely agree, and that is why today I signed off 560 million funds to procure, to help us procure the system that would help us to do E2E procurement beginning January, because we have been procrastinating and pushing forward this in almost eternity. It must come to a stop. We must do it. Then on the issue of KRA, I again have pronounced myself, the President has pronounced himself on reforms at KRA. The first institutions that I held a meeting with immediately after my swearing in was KRA. And we are in the process of coming up with a, a, pro, a, a system. Uh, the, pro, the system that we have at KRA is over 10 years old. So we must modernize, we must come up with a new system, a new system to collect our taxes and we must also talk to KRA staff to change the mindset. Uh, let me move a little quickly. Again, here there is the non-discretionary expenditure um, uh, which have been occasioned by changes in government policies. That, that is true, but I think this is a, 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 a big and wider issue to be dealt with. Uh, some of the decisions that we take, and that is why uh, under my leadership at the Treasury, I want predictable tax regime. I don't want us to come up with many, I mean, changes in tax policies almost every day. Because I think that is what has occasioned largely some of the uh, non-discretionary expenditures that we are encountering in the counties. And even at the national government level, by the way. So I am in agreement that we need to keep our policies predictable so that we can avoid unnecessary um, disturbance and um, let me call it internal shocks to our economy. Why is it so easy to slash funds for the county government and not NGCDF? Uh, uh, Senator Boni and the committee, maybe for your information, we as Treasury proposed to reduce NGCDF, but do we have power to pass the appropriations uh, bill, no. It is passed under National Assembly. So that is my answer to that. What is my view about NGCDF in the light of court declaring it unconstitutional? With all due respect uh, to the committee, I would request that I don't give my opinion on this because I'm told this judgment is coming. There's a judgment coming this week. So allow the judiciary to deal with it, uh, Senator Boni, if, I, if you don't mind. Uh, I don't want to get, enter into some territories that uh, I may be accused of other, of other things. What do, they, what do we call it? Uh, where you get into the space of the judiciary? Subjudice, yes. Um... Honorable Nyonka, I think that's a very strong opinion. And I understand it. Yeah. You know, the people of KC elected him to protect money, especially money going to counties, that we shouldn't cut it. The only way, place where I don't agree with him is that we have money. I think this is a language that we must debunk. We don't have money in this country to run our, uh, to meet our expenditure effectively. What we must do is to make sure that the money that we, we get more. So we will get more, A, by collecting more, B, by using what we have prudently, 
and three cutting on expenditure. So as it is, if you look at our budget figures, we don't have money. We don't have that money. And I've just demonstrated. We actually have been living a lie as a country. We are borrowing money to meet our recurrent expenditure. By the way, I didn't tell this committee that our recurrent expenditure at the national government level is 400 billion by year. So that money, that expenditure is met from the borrowed funds, a lot of which is at very high interest rates, 18% for domestic borrowing. So we must, and even the commercial debt outside there, we borrowed Eurobond just the other day to, borrow, to pay another Eurobond at 11% interest rate. So these are things that we must stop. And the best way to stop it is to accept fiscal consolidation and also to accept expenditure. And not only accept it when that cut is somewhere else. Even when the cut is affecting us, we should accept. Parliament, executive, judiciary, and the counties. All of us must agree and accept uh, a cut. Uh, I've been asked by the substantive chair to internalize, and I think the chair, uh, the, the session chair, you also alluded to this, that I should internalize what the members are saying. If you noticed, I don't know whether I betrayed myself, but I was very, very attentive when each member was speaking, and I was trying to internalize. And by the way, I am completely in agreement. If we had more money, we should give counties even more than 400 billion. The only thing I'm saying is that the present economic situation does not allow us to live normally. We must live a little bit abnormally by cutting our clothes according to our sizes. Each one of us must tighten our belts. And then uh, the substantive chair also said that um, I am indicating that, 20, that money going to the counties is 24, 24.2%, that that is not accurate, that is actually less than 15% based on projected revenue. But I think the substantive chair is, is not talking about what is in the Constitution. He is not quoting the Constitution. The Constitution, the people of Kenya in their own wisdom, decided to peg the 15% to the last audited accounts. So if I go by the Constitution, the provisions of the Constitution, it is 24.2%. And I even had some latitude and used the last revenue collection of 2023-24, it is still 16.6%. But if you now base it on projected revenue, which is a projection anyway, then it, it comes to 14.4%, which is below 15%. But that is not the Constitution. How do, we expect the, how do you expect the county government to deal with these expenditures? I think that, again, I have addressed. Finally, the issue of equalization fund has come up. And I'm in agreement that, you see, this fund was supposed to run for a period, is it 20 years? and terminates, or if with the approval of Parliament, then would be extended for a further period. But then, from 2014, when the, this fund became active, that it should have been operationalized, it faced a number of challenges that Treasury, first, there were claims that there is no legal framework, then Treasury uh, was maybe not supportive of this. I was a member of the National Assembly during this period, and we kept on asking this question in the Budget Committee and even on the floor of the House. But then where we are is that a lot of this, many of these financial years, there was no appropriation. So as we speak, the fund was not appropriated in, for many financial years. There is, I think, about 10 billion. I may need to get the figures. I presented the same to IBEC the other day. There's about 10 billion amount or thereabouts which has been appropriated and has not been disbursed. Uh, about 12 billion has been disbursed to the fund. Yeah? 12.4 has been disbursed to the fund. There's uh, an amount that has not been disbursed. That is why what we have now released 147 million. You are asking me, Chair, where this 147? It's just a figure, uh, just to, to, be, put, to be added uh, to demonstrate, I would say, 
that we are alive to the fact that we need to pay the arrears. But at that rate, I would agree with you, we may not complete, clear the arrears. But I, we made a commitment to IBEC. I made a commitment to IBEC. I didn't foresee this, so I didn't carry uh, my uh, commitment to IBEC. I think we agreed to settle it in three years, if I'm not wrong. It was, it was the four years. It was four years. So we, we, we are supposed to clear the, that arrears. So the 147, it is, there is no scientific calculation to it. I think it was meant to round off from 7 point something to uh, 8 billion. Uh, we 7.87, I think, to 8 billion. Because what should have been provided in this year was 7.87 billion. So there is no scientific method through which we have. Uh... So, so I was not putting it, Honorable Eddie, uh, that, that, that I was showing magnanimity from Treasury. This is a constitutional requirement. So when we do it, it's not something that we are doing to demonstrate that we are doing something unusual or, or we are being uh, uh, generous to the counties. No. Well, we have just tabulated the share of revenue, the county equitable share that is going to the counties, and we have indicated where the, we have the total share of revenue, we have indicated, we have put the national government, we have put equalization fund. This was just for information purposes, for disclosure. It was not meant really to persuade this committee that that is the main reason why they should accept the reduction of 20 uh, billion. So I think um, I'll stop there, Chair. I don't know whether there's anything that I've left out and attended to. Thank you. Uh, just a minute. I wanted to give it uh, to Chair uh, Senator Ali Roba. Are you still online with us? Senator Ali Roba, Chair. Sorry? Uh, Senator Chair, if you could ad adjust your volume. I wanted to release the team online, maybe. <laughs> Senator Nyonka? Okay, you can just text the chair to uh, so that we're on the same uh, uh, page uh, as uh, I, I give it uh, to members, uh, Honorable Waziri. You've... Uh, shared the the letter from the president and uh, touched on clause 5 or point 5 the first sentence reading uh, that uh, the executive directs your office to do a proposal the concern that this committee is having keenly and one of the common denominators that denominators that has come out is on the issue of the amounts the amounts for our CHPs that is amounting to about 3.1 uh, billion. There's amount to the CAIPs, 11.7 NSSF, you know, enhanced contributions. The directive of your proposal, why did you not, for example, suggest a reduction of 1 billion? Why 20 billion? The answer is still not really justifiable. The other concerns you've stated before this committee, the issue of the deaths and all that, that, that's fine. But just narrowing it down to the county, the allocation to the county, what wisdom was put in place that justifies the tweet? Because it's still not justifiable. Does it mean now we dismiss all the CHPs? Does it mean that we do not adhere to the policies of NSSF that has been set? The issue of the housing levy? What then are we supposed to do? What should the counties do? Should also the counties not borrow? Yet disbursement is always delayed. Should our people at the counties not get their salaries on time? Putting in mind, the same revenue that you collect also comes from the same 47 counties. Why did you not even reduce 1 billion? Why 20 billion? It's still 
not really coming out that justifies all this. I give it to Senator uh, Boni Alwane. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I have heard you and I'm persuaded. But I want to appeal to you. Uh, when you say there's no money in Kenya, I want you to relate it to the good old writing, which I suspect you have read, the story of the acres of diamonds. If you ask me, give a different person and ask us to leave this republic, you will find that wherever they will have taken us, there will be net donors to us. There is enough in this country. You said it yourself, Minister, that one of the remedies is to cut down on expenses. What do you want Kenyans to do if that is the policy? It's in your hands. Cut those expenses in the national government. One, cut expenses in hospitality. The president spoke to it when he addressed it during that difficult time. It is in your hands. Cut expenses on unconstitutional officers. The president spoke to it when he addressed us to bring the country together. Why are we still factoring money for those unconstitutional officers, which include the officers of the first lady of the president, the first lady of the deputy president, the first lady of the prime cabinet secretary. Why? Why are you spending money on unconstitutional officers, the office of the prime cabinet secretary? And why can't you cut expenses on advisors? Ministers have advisors, governors have advisors, prime cabinet secretary, the deputy president, the president. You promised us as government that we're going to cut it. This will cut expenses. Should our county government suffer and fail because you want to massage the egos of the husbands of the first ladies? Why I came from Kakamega to Nairobi, I did not come here to participate in massaging the egos of some people. I came here to protect the interest of the vulnerable so that we can move our country forward. Make this difficult decision. Uh, I remember you found me in Parliament when you came for the first time. And we worked very well with you. But you remember also for five years, I left you in Parliament. And while I was there mangering and doing my own silly things, including pool fighting, I was not pushing the taxpayer to give me a job to do things. This craze of giving everybody a job, causing the government to fail. When you are in cabinet, my brother, I know Suba, we've been with you there doing rallies. Uh, we've eaten fish together with you there. You give me lectures every time we share with you a flight to Kisumu, and I always enjoy. Let's make a difference. There is enough money in Kenya. Depunk that thought. Proceed, Senator Edi. Uh, you know, <laughs> I still I still see the CS. <laughs> As a, as a former chair of ODM, so I, I still trade with caution <laughs> uh, because I, I don't want my certificate interfered with. But uh, that's on a lighter note. Just to say that I am getting us almost going to a common argument called what aboutism. Yes. What aboutism is a is a is a 
practice where where there is conflicting scenarios 